The views expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of 94.9 CHRW. What's that? Another prisoner, maybe. Join me for dinner? I don't think he was going to eat it anyway, do you? He's dead. I think I've lost my appetite. Good morning, London. It is Thursday, June 21st, 2012. I'm Bob Met. And I'm Robert Vaughn. And this is Just Right on CHRW 94.9 FM. Where we'll be with you from now until noon. And on that right wing. Just Right. Fade into color and color into black and white. Under the bedclothes, everything will be all right. The writer of the Voyager episode, The Shoot, with which we opened our show today, and we'll hear a bit more from later, must have been a guest of the Elgin Middlesex London Detention Center. It is perhaps the most horrifying episodes of that sci-fi series, and yet everything that happened in that episode of prison horror, where the inmates run the asylum and where no one is accountable, is exactly what's going on right under our noses here in London, Ontario. If ever there was a horror story to tell, and not just one horror story, but too many to count, this is it. I think something must be done about this, and this show is only part of what I intend to do about it. I want to introduce our guests today, and we do have a couple of interesting guests. First, uh, Kevin. Good morning. Lawyer with Mackenzie Lake. You are representing now, how many cases are you working on? Uh, I have approximately 30 cases on the go presently. Every time I hear your voice, that number goes up. Yes. Yeah. I, in fact, I got uh, another call this morning about a beating that happened on the weekend. And just before we continue with you, we want to introduce also in the in the studio with us here is Robert Broly. Hello, Robert. You're Hello. Good morning. We're going to call you Rob today. Is that okay? Rob's because we're, we've got three of us in here. We outnumber the Kevins, so we yeah. win. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you were you were incarcerated at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. Is that yes, correct? Yes, I was. And uh, you had a, you're going to have an experience to tell us about, I take it. I'd be glad to. Okay, well, let's just start with uh, Kevin first. Kevin, um, I first heard about this when you started making the issue a little public in some of the other media, and I certainly was shocked at what I was hearing. I just couldn't believe that some of the things that are going on are going on. Yeah, It, it is shocking. It's, it's, uh, it certainly surprised me when I came upon it. Uh, I, I first became involved when uh, Randy Drysdale was killed at, at Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, I represented uh, some of his family members at the inquest into his death. We'll be hearing a little bit more about that a little later. Actually, what we haven't heard about that, if I could just interject, is whatever happened to the people who murdered Randy Drysdale? Nothing. Nothing. Um, their, their names uh, uh, seem to be known to the authorities, uh, but um, there really hasn't been any, as far as I can tell, any uh, real effort in, in bringing them to justice. Really? Do you, do you have any, any idea why? Well, one of the big problems is that witnesses are afraid to come forward. Right. I mean, there, there's a, a system out there where if you rat on someone, you're going to get the same thing. Uh, so so uh, people uh, who testified uh, somewhat anonymously at the inquest are afraid to go public. And there are no surveillance cameras in there? There are no surveillance cameras in the common areas whatsoever. We have them in our schools, but not in our prisons. That's right. We have them in in parking lots around the city, but for some reason they can't see their way to putting them in places where crimes are committed on a regular basis. Is that a matter of policy of the uh, detention center, or is that a provincial policy or a privacy issue? Do you you know why we don't have the cameras in there? No, I understand that there have been business cases made for many years uh, to to put them in in the common areas, Um, and and, uh, I have yet to determine why they haven't put them in. But certainly, uh, you know, uh, closed-circuit television is, is present in a lot of our other prisons. Oh, is it? 
Yes. And do they experience the same sort of brutality that goes on at the uh, Elgin Middlesex Detention Center? No. From everything I've heard, there's no place in North America that it experiences the same kind of brutality as what happens right here in, in uh, good old London. Before we continue, let's take our first break now, and let's hear that story about Randy Drysdale. Shall we do that? And then we can continue and keep, can keep our conversation going to the bottom of the hour without a break. We'll break away now. This next clip is from uh, CTV London News from 2011, November the 2nd. Randy Drysdale was a 46-year-old father of two waiting for a bail hearing on assault and shoplifting charges, but he never made it out of the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center alive. There he uh, was beaten up by two inmates and um, dragged then by a third inmate into the washroom area. The beating was so brutal that um, it caused bleeding in his brain and uh, he died about a week later. Kevin Egan is representing several of Randy's family members in a lawsuit against the province. An inquest into his death was held last fall. It's a failure to properly supervise, to, to monitor the area, and to keep it safe. Mr. Drysdale was put into uh, an area that housed convicted criminals. He was never convicted of anything. Overcrowding is definitely an issue here. The Elgin Middlesex Detention Center is one of the largest facilities of its kind in the whole province. The lawsuit claims it was originally built to house 150 inmates. Right now, there are more than 400. The guards are stressed to the limit. The place has become quite hostile. And in fact, what goes on inside the cell block is that the, the inmates run it. So we can't do our job properly when we don't have the proper amount of staffing. Last week, guards at the EMDC, who are also members of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, held a protest against the hiring freeze at the centre. I'd like to see more staff. I'd like to see nurses 24 hours a day. And I'd like to see the facility enlarge to actually fit the amount of inmates that we have. Egan says his is one of two lawsuits filed in this case. The other involves the wife of Randy Drysdale. What we're hoping is that the public becomes aware of what's happening in our backyards here. That people are dying needlessly and that really it's an inhumane system that's been allowed to develop out there. So far, there is no dollar figure in the lawsuit. None of the allegations have been proven yet in court. Nick Paparella, CTV News. And he pulled me off the guy. Come on, a wonderful human being. It's a joke. It's a joke. The sign says comedy. It doesn't say take seriously. Relax. Okay. Well, we want you to take this one seriously. It's really funny. You know, when people hear humor about people in prison, they don't, they, you know, it's kind of something we accept in society, isn't it? Uh, jokes about gang rapes, jokes about things like that, almost as if society has this attitude like, well, they all deserve it. Is, is that a problem you're running into, Kevin? Absolutely. I, I hear people say, well, you know, they get whatever they deserve. They, they've gone over to the dark side. And, and, and uh, so, uh, you know, whatever uh, rough justice is, is leveled against them, once they uh, are put behind bars, uh, so be it. That's, that's well, the way it should be. What people don't understand, I think, is that with the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center, anybody can end up there. That's right. Male or female? There, there are uh, facilities there for females as well. And uh, it's a holding place, so if somebody accuses a person of doing something uh, unlawful, the police can arrest that person and put them in this detention center um, and awaiting bail hearing, awaiting a trial, awaiting justice, right? That's so right. they could be very well be innocent of all charges, and yet they have to go through this torture. Yes, and, and in fact, that's exactly what happened with Jesse Hennembury, uh, who unfortunately hasn't arrived yet today, but, but Jesse was, was arrested and charged with an offense uh, that he never committed, uh, and, and the charges were eventually withdrawn. But uh, uh, within minutes of arriving in the cell block, he was beaten so severely that uh, he had uh, fractures to his face and, and, uh, and 
went unconscious. And he was innocent of all all charges. He was innocent him. of all he charges. He was just an innocent bystander in the whole issue. Yeah, but you know, but, it really doesn't matter if someone's innocent or guilty. Correct. Of an That's offense, right. uh, they shouldn't be treated that way. Nobody deserves to have their skull fractured. That's right. But, uh, it's, nobody it's, deserves to be terrorized to the but point it's just that they're point, afraid to come out. It's just to point out that a lot of the people in that facility haven't been processed yet. They're not guilty or innocent, and we don't even know where a lot of them are in terms of that status until after they've yes. been prosecuted. 519-661-3600 is a number you can call if you want to join our conversation today. In the studio with us is Kevin Egerton, who is representing several people who have been f- found uh, some problems down at the Elgin Middlesex uh, Detention Center. And also joining us is Robert Broly, who has been there. Now, Rob, tell us about your experience and how you ended up in there and what happened to you. Um, Can't be, well, first of all, before you do that, what what has made given you the courage to come forward to do this? You're obvious. This is not an easy thing to do. Can't be. No. Um. It started off basically for getting compensation uh, for what has happened to me out there. But then when I found out that people had sons and daughters and dads that didn't make it, um, I talked to one and she said, "You be the voice because he can't." Um, and so it's gone beyond the, the money thing, the compensation. It's, 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 um, it's absurd. Uh, uh, people are dying, maimed, uh, disabled for life. Um, and I can answer why there's no cameras in there, because they don't want to be held accountable. They know what's going on. Sometimes the guards are participating in it. I've seen it. What happened to me in 2004, uh, I was struggling with an addiction. Uh, I kited a check. Uh, for approximately $600, and I was sentenced to 30 days in Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. Uh, to earn the time before that, I had a little small home maintenance business that I did around the city, cleaning the troughs and pressure washing, that sort of thing. And one is in the general population, um, they have what's called yard, where you go out and you circle around in, in enclosed concrete walls, and you, mm-hmm. it's your yard time where you get out of the cells. And all the inmates that want to go, go out there, and there's guards that supervise you, and you kind of walk around in circles. And um, I heard Rob over my shoulder, and I looked back, and I'm not going to mention any names, but this officer, I'd done East Rock cleaning every year at his house. So he's like, you know, come here, come here. So I went up, kind of shook his hand, and um, yeah, he's always a good man. He had a family, and we always got along good. I didn't know he was a guard. Right. He was like, I never thought you'd be here. He said, what'd you do? I said, well, I made a mistake. And so, didn't think anything about it. I said bye, and I kept walking. And then when I got upstairs, um, I was uh, cornered. And you got a picture of the, the cell, the common areas are like a pie shaped. So they have one, one corner is kind of, it goes to a point, and the rest comes out, and there's two doors. And mm-hmm. So they cornered me, and they said, how do you know that guy? And I said, well, didn't think anything of it. I said, I did work in this house. And uh, did his maintenance. And uh, they said, we want his address. And I basically, then they looked like they were just ready, very angry, very violent type of postures. And I said, no. I said, sorry. I actually do not going to say what I told them to say. Uh, I did say. Mm-hmm. I told them to go mm, themselves. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, now they're actually asking you for the address of this guard. Officer, you know? yeah. Okay. okay. Now, I didn't know why at that point. Now, come to find out uh, that they, um, they, Three of them had called the the officer in question uh, a gay or uh, what do you call it? Uh, I'll be honest with you, straight up, a faggot. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so then they took a swing at the guard. Well, next thing you know, the f- four or five, six guards put these guys in the hospital at Vic. Okay, so they wanted to find out where he lived to pay back and visit him and his family. That's was that was the gig. But I didn't I didn't give it up. Now we went to eat dinner and they. Um, they lock you down, supposedly to protect you, because a lot of people were stealing people's meals. When the cards came in, they're sitting out there, and the bigger guys were taking the trays and going, "All right, kid, you're you're going hungry." So they lock you down in the cell, and they bring in the cart. Okay, but now it doesn't make any sense now because they bring in the carts, and the senior inmates distribute the food. And the guards leave the cart and walk out, and they go do their thing, and they come back and pick up the cart when everybody's done feeding. So if you've pissed off these senior inmates, then your cell is bypassed and you don't get to eat. And if you complain, they kick your head in. 
So I'm sitting here playing chess after watching with a your guard uh, in front of the TV, and they have a history over there. What they do is they come up behind you with the towel, and they will actually physically put it over your head and twist it from behind so they can run you around like a, a chicken. You can't see, you can't do anything. Once you get control of something, right over your eyes and not. everything. So they try yeah. to put it over my head from the back, and. I quickly realized what was happening, and I got my thumb underneath it, and I pushed out. By that time, I'm taking shots on either side, and my feet are like a picnic bench. You know how your, your feet mm -hmm. are underneath here? So I got myself up, uh, and I honestly say today I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for um, some martial arts training. I was fighting these guys. I could finally see, and I'm hitting them. They're hitting me. They're sweeping my feet out. They're sweeping the thing, and, and uh, they're punching me. I'm punching them. And then uh, I, at the meantime, I'm backed up against the doors. There's two doors to, for e exits and entrance. I'm, be I'm beating on it with one foot against the thing as I'm fighting these guys, saying, Kia, help, help. I mean, I got five guys on me. I, you know, I don't mm -hmm. care how skilled you are. I was losing. And a guy said, hey, and I looked to the right, and he took a, a cup that was just packed with um, wet toilet paper and palmed it. And basically when I said, hey, and I looked over this way, he basically smashed it into my face. And um, uh, instantly the blood was squirted out everywhere. They all ran back to the corner of their little pie shape there. There was all 60 of them. Uh, I'm beating on the thing, and I'm going from door to door, and I'm looking at the blood trail that's going, and it's just, I can't stop it. So I look down, and I see the towel that they tried to kill me with it was the towel that saved my life. And I put it up to my face, and I kept beating and beating. Finally, they came in, and uh, uh, coincidentally, the officer that had said hi downstairs, down there, was like, oh, my God, Rob. And he pulled the towel up, and he said, don't move. Oh my God! Don't move, man. I could just see the blood trail. It was disgusting. Uh, I couldn't see out of this eye, um, so they rushed me to uh, the hospital um, and brought me back. Uh, well, they did. This that's another thing there. They they did the the CAT scans and and all this, and then he sewed me up. But by the time the plastic surgeon got there, I couldn't work on me because my head was so swollen. Uh, I suffered uh, three cranial fractures to the skull. 27 stitches just look this way mm -hmm. and along there underneath my eye so when they basically the cup was curved like that when they smashed you like that they were console they were considered indestructible that's why they bought them but they're actually weapons might as well give the guy a knife when he comes in here because i've seen people what they do is they put it they stack it with wet toilet paper and stick it in a sock and that's just like hitting somebody with a with a, a cue ball over the head okay. and i've seen it many times it's just crack of the skull when it cracked me it was a crack like a mm -hmm. it was Unreal. So anyway, I came back from the hospital. They sewed me up. They didn't do anything. They were just it was the attitude there was uh, the police officer did come and said who was who was it that did it. And at that point, I was like, <laughs> I don't know nothing, man. I didn't give up the officer's name, and I'm not telling who did this. I don't. I was scared out of my gourd because I couldn't. At that point, my face had swollen up where I couldn't see. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm I'm stuck. I'm at other people's mercy, and now they're going to bring me back to the institution. All right, and everybody knows it's if the guards and the inmates. I mean, they're they're two different things. That's like God and the devil. You don't talk to them. You don't, you know, you keep your mouth shut. So they had put me into a place an infirmary. Not it was infirmary. They didn't have an infirmary there. They put me in solitary confinement. Um, and they came, and the, a couple of officers came in and said, "Right, Rob, you, you didn't tell them. You didn't tell them the address." I said, no, I didn't. He said, and that's when I found out what the officer that came into my cell that I did work for told me what had happened a year and a half ago with these particular inmates. It was kind of a, a bad setup that I didn't know. Uh, and so they put me in a solitary confinement cell, and I couldn't see at that point. And if it wasn't for Bernie Doerr of um, Justice and Correctional Service of Salvation Army, a friend of my parents in Florida, he lead me around by the arm. I was scared out of my gourd. I wouldn't go anywhere because I couldn't see, and walking down the halls to the little checkups or whatever, um, he, he was a blessing. But I tell you what, I didn't realize what I was into, but the solitary confinement, there was a psych, a guy that had uh, uh, mental health issues, and he took his feces and did the caulking around the cells and over the air vents, oh, and they put me in there. And I couldn't see, but I could smell. Every time I go to eat, mm -hmm. especially around the door, uh, and... Um, I, it was really hot, and I was trying to take a pencil. I couldn't see you trying to clear the airways because sometimes they put uh, wet toilet paper up over them because it gets too cold, and I, I didn't know what I was doing. But when I could see, f eventually, after a month, well, it wasn't a month. It was about two and a half, three weeks. I could well, see. You were in there for that period of time. Oh, yeah, they didn't release me. They, they kept me. 
Yeah. Weren't you, wasn't your term just 30 days? Yes, it was. And yeah. how many days did you serve? Okay, I served, uh, was 20 something, but this had, this incident happened like a, two days into my sentence. Oh, I see. So uh, it was like two and a half weeks later when I could actually see again. Um, the, um, it, it was, I was just brutal. I was like, I protected you, and then, but they were mad at me because I wouldn't tell who did it. Even though they had blood splatter on the guys, they said I didn't press charges, I didn't that, because at that point I was uh, in fear of my life. You know, if I told on them, I mean, were they going to pass word down to the people that are in solitary confinement? And then, you know, no. when I go to take a shower, <coughs> I no, get it. What I'm hearing here is these, these guys in that prison, the actual prisoners, everyone there is there for two years less a day. Is that the idea? Well, that would be the maximum, yes. Uh, so that means they're going to be released into the community again at some point in time, theoretically. Right. I, I mean, they, they may be holding people who are destined for a penitentiary, but anyone serving a sentence there mm-hmm. would, would be uh, two mm-hmm. years or, or less. Do we have a caller? Yeah, uh, we have a caller yeah. on the line. Go ahead, Kathy. Hello? Caller still there? I don't think it looks like we lost our caller. Carry on. <laughs> Is there any way I can hear that? Yeah. Yeah, when, when, when so, we get a call. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I, I was saying that, that it, it's, a, it's a detention center. People are serving mm-hmm. sentences there uh, of, of no more than uh, two years less a day. So they're going to be out in the community, and here they are, the type of people that seem to want to get vengeance on anybody, and we're going to set these people loose, and we're going to leave them in there just festering like that until, until they're out. And then we wonder why we have a crime wave all the time. It, it's almost like a school of crime. I mean, there, there's a culture in there that, that uh, makes violence okay. And, and, and that's how you, uh, how you settle your, your disputes is by beating somebody up. And, and, and it's done by gangs. It's not, it's not an honorable way of fighting. It's uh, uh, four on one or, or uh, you know, six on one. Um, and and they use weapons. They they use these plastic cups. They use uh, bars of soap in a sock, um, whatever they can get their hands on, and and exact their uh, rough form of justice on on whoever doesn't follow the rules. Uh, you know the the, the uh, institution has given up the uh, the the control of the cell blocks to the more powerful, meaner. Uh, inmates. Uh, Robert referred to them as the senior inmates. You even saw a sign out there that said, you saw me, that, that, that said, follow the, follow the instructions of the senior inmates. There's signs out there. And it who is, made up the signs? They, they weren't like... Well, it, it had to have been the... Professionally made signs. I don't know if they're professionally made signs. I was made aware of it myself, but I know what the code is out there. But Mr. Egan said that he has a client that actually physically saw the signs. I haven't been in it since 2004, thank God. I've been... No, so what happened to you is, we're, we're talking 2004. Yes, I am. I haven't so been. this is not a recent phenomenon. No. This has been going on for years yeah. and years. I think I was the first one. I was the worst assault in the history of El Gomez. At that point, there was no deaths at that point. Um, I had another attorney that had started it, but uh, he... Um, it was basically what's called a stalled lawsuit. He just he got overwhelmed by the attorney general's flood of paperwork and basically got overwhelmed. So we mm-hmm. let it stall. And then I saw an article with Mr. Egan about something that happened similar to me, and I called Mr. Egan. I was going to ask you how you got in touch with him. <laughs> uh, I thought, oh my God, my uh, actually my roommate came home and slapped down the paper. We saw it in McDonald's, and I was like, I'm going to give this guy a ding. So uh, yeah, no, and, and it's. Some of the stories I'm hearing are eerily similar. I mean, it's just, it's a fact is that kids, the kids, say if you're gay or whatever, and I'm, you know, to each his own, personally, I'm heterosexual, they don't get fed. And they have no control because the guards that bring the carts in, and these guys, kids are starving. I mean, they're not being fed Mm -hmm. because the senior inmates are the one distributing the food. And if they don't like you or they think you're whatever, you're not going to eat. And then if they, they can't bitch, they, excuse me, they can't express their concern because then the guards, they laugh and walk away and then they get dragged in the shower and their head beaten against the thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's nuts. You know, what about the guards there? I mean, I've heard comments on both sides. One is that they are sort of stuck in a situation that they can't really control 400 inmates in a place of 150. Yeah. And 
I hear the other argument is that they're actually doing the beating. They're actually letting it go on. Yeah. Um, what's your experience towards the guards? My, are some of them okay? My, my experience is that uh, it's just like any other workplace. There is good and there's bad. Okay, I seen uh, the particular man that I worked for it was a family man, a good man. I mean, he. Uh, there are good people there, but there are, uh, and I experienced and saw some physically disabled or mentally handicapped people that would just couldn't control some of their verbal things because let's face it you know I had an addiction a lot of people in there they have mental health issues because if you were totally sane and, and stable you wouldn't commit a crime and so it's a shame I've seen some of them handicapped physically saw with my own eyes the officers punch them or trip them or uh, knock their feet out from underneath them or bang their head against the wall now and let's take the the best guard there how good can a guard be if he can let this go on? You were only there for 30 days and you've they, seen all of this stuff they, go they on. They have uh, what's called a code of silence. It's just kind of like, uh, kind of like, not, I'm not going to say like organized crime. Well, that's a good one, yeah. Uh, where if you don't, you know, if you even see your buddy, uh, personally, I, I couldn't do that. I, I'd either have to resign or walk away or, or, or pull him aside and say, look at it, man, if I see you doing this again, then we're going to have an issue. Um, I don't know. I know that the, there's a few of them there that that, uh, that seem to be good, but when you bring up that point, it doesn't make any sense because if they're watching what's going on, even though they're not participating, they're just as guilty as anybody else. That that's that's what it's I occurring agree. to me yeah, is I that it, they are guilty yeah. by tacit approval by not commenting on it or, or going. I mean, how how much is their job worth? when they can see human beings being degraded and beaten and killed and murdered well, right in front of them without commenting on it. I am... Um, I am. They must be getting paid a hell of a lot of money to be able to keep their mouths shut. I could see out of this, I couldn't see out of this eye when they dragged me out uh, on my back, I mean, by the, by the uniform, right out about 30 feet, because I was like, get me away from them people, you know. Turns out that they had... Uh, the inmates had developed a system, okay, there's one officer on, one officer off. There's always two officers, okay? Both of them left their post for me, okay? It's one goes to the bathroom, one goes to eat because someone's got to be there to monitor them, and they can't see you. Like, okay, if you're sitting here, there's the common area. It's all a wall, and there's a door there and a door there, so all I can do is hear. Mm -hmm. okay, there's no video monitoring. There's no nothing. So all they have to do is yell. I was yelling, nobody responded because they were involved in a fight. Because every time they call code blue or something, all the officers leave their post and go to this one cell block. So they, because they, because they, it's the spirit of violence. Okay, if people are in there fighting, then they get involved in that, and then they they put their gloves on and they're garrotted in there. No. So they left me all alone with sixty guys. <laughs> Thank God, it was only five on me because I, I I suffered the cranial fractures. I've got uh, a brain scan for Doctor Speck Institute. Uh, I've got a, t a traumatic brain injury. They've got uh, frontal lobe damage, uh, post traumatic stress disorder. And now ADHD, so I'm on disability for life because of this injury. Um, and your only crime at the time was writing a bum check. Well, actually, I didn't even write it. I kind of, uh, at that point, I had good credit, and my addiction took over, and the, the bank machine kept giving me money back when I put the blank envelopes in. So oh. I, I thought, <laughs> yeah, I scored. <laughs> that's, yeah. Not, that's not to say that no matter what you did, mm, nobody yeah. deserves no. what happened like that. Well, at the time, too, I don't... Uh, I, I don't well, I no, I can't say that because you know what? The time that you get detained is a punishment enough when you have to sleep on the floor beside a toilet. Uh, and I slept there many nights, and a guy's squatting over you, or you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel a little splash in your face and you cover up. Uh, it, it's just totally inhumane. Um, That's an understatement. I, I, it's I, I just can't believe what I'm hearing from you and from all the rest. Now, this happened two years ago. That would mean most of the people that were in there with you... Two years? Uh, eight years ago. Year, no, I said just years ago, like yeah, lots yeah, of years yeah. ago. So, most of the people that were in there with you aren't there anymore, theoretically, right? So, we've got a whole new generation of people doing the same thing. But it, it's a culture. It, it's, it's a, thing a thing complete that's cultural thing. Ever since my injury, uh, it's, 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 it's progressed. Uh, now people are dead. Um, uh, it's um, and it's amazing because I don't I don't like agree with um, some some of the crimes they think are more serious than other ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, when a person comes in and say that they did a sexual offense, and 
I've never done anything like that, but I've seen the culture that's in there. Mm -hmm. The guards sometimes will let the inmates know what that particular inmate has done, whether it be involving children or whatever, and then uh, you know what happens after that. Well, I heard that there was one sex offender um, introduced into the population, and the guards told... Now, this is hearsay, so you can, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe, Kevin, you can tell me whether or not this is true. Then the guard told the uh, inmates what the uh, crime was, and 27 of them beat him up in succession. Is that correct? That, that's right. Um, that, that individual, uh, I think I can say his name, was Thomas Hurst, uh, somewhat uh, infamous uh, for a, a, a devious sex crime, uh, was uh, brought to a cell block. Uh, the guards went to the cell block ahead of time and said, uh, we're bringing him here, you've got 10 minutes. So the entire uh, cell block loaded themselves up with, with those plastic cups, with bars of soap, whatever they could. And um, one of my clients has told me this story that he participated in it because he felt compelled to. He felt that if he didn't participate in the beating, he was going to get it as well. So he was, he was beaten up, uh, the, this Mr. Hurst was beaten up uh, quite badly. His face was all welted and cut, and, um, and my client stepped in and kicked him because he felt he had to do something. Uh, and uh, then 10 minutes later, the guards came back and dragged him out, bleeding and, and cut and screaming. Amazing stuff. We're at the bottom of the hour. got to take a break. We'll be back right after this. I was walking on Bloor Street down to Young, and I was walking behind this older woman. She had to be 85 or 90, right? There's this group of four teenagers with skateboards over by this construction area on Bloor and Young, and there's gravel around. These four kids were picking up handfuls of rocks, and they were throwing them at people as they went by, and no one was doing anything, right? Because you can't hit kids anymore, right? That's what they say. I feel differently about it. I think not only should you be allowed to beat kids, I don't think they should have to be your own. So these kids are hitting people and no one's doing anything, right? And I'm walking behind this lady and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way, there's no way they're going to throw rocks at this older person, right? I mean, and I'm right behind her and then all of a sudden a big rock hits her in the head from the handful and knocks her glasses off to the side and cuts her and a rock, like three of them hit me, right? I've never been so angry at my li in my life, right? I looked at these kids and then the one who threw the rocks actually jumped out in front of the old lady thinking it's funny and went, blue like this, eh? And then laughed, him and his buddies. My, 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 my blood level, it's just like, and then he goes to jump in front of me and do the same thing. But what he didn't realize is I've done time in jail. And I don't mind going back, quite frankly. I've never felt so wanted every day. <laughs> Someone wanted to shower with me. I mean, they called it a date, but we never left the cell. This one's mine. I say he's not. He's the reason that I'm here. It was my partner in a bombing. And then this scum confessed to the tribunal and gave them my name. So I'm telling you again, he's mine. Welcome back. We're in studio with Robert Broly and Kevin Egan, lawyer with Mackenzie Lake, who's representing now 30 and upwards um, prisoners and ex-prisoners, I guess, of the Elgin right. Middlesex Detention Center who are coming forward, perhaps at long last. Are a lot of them older cases? Or are they all current? or are they? Uh, there's a mixture. In fact, I have a number of them who are still in Elgin Middlesex Detention oh, wow. Center and, and are calling me and, and sort of whispering on the phone about what happened last weekend. You know, and, and uh, then I've got... Uh, well, Mr. Broly uh, is is a fairly older case. Uh, I've got uh, cases that are older than his, which also involve those plastic cups. 
so it, it's quite a mixture. Uh, I've got a, a number of guys who are serving time on, on weekends who are coming out during the week and coming and talking to me about what happened last weekend. And uh, one of them in, in particular described how he has to sleep on the floor. He's, a, he's an older gentleman, he's in his 60s, um, some drug problems. He's sleeping on the floor because he's the weaker of the three guys in the cell. The guards are phoning in sick uh, or, or unavailable for work. And so they're so understaffed that they're not allowed out of the cell for the entire 60 hours that he's serving. So he spends 60 hours in a 12 by 18 foot cell with two other bigger inmates who, who take the beds. He's sitting there, lying on the floor. They get up in the middle of the night to use the toilet and he's got to pull the sheets up over his head to stop the splashing. He's described to me uh, where they smuggle in drugs. They, they, they put a, a kinder surprise up their rectum and, and in the middle of the night uh, they extract it and, and uh, then clean off the, uh, the feces from the, uh, from the kinder surprise with a towel and throw it on the floor. And he described that that happened early Saturday morning one weekend he was in there. That towel remained on the floor uh, where, where his bed was until he left on the Monday morning and he had to eat his meals there. Uh, increasingly, we're hearing stories about hygiene issues, which we hadn't heard uh, going back a few years. Uh, it, it seems to be getting worse. Oh, I was just going to say. In fact, um, there was evidence unrefuted before uh, Justice Leroy recently uh, that, um, that there were bed bugs, that, that one of the inmates was uh, forced to sleep on the floor and, and his mattress had bed bugs. In Speaking it. of health issues, um, Laura Strawn is another... Uh, instance of a person dying as a result, um, I understand, of inadequate medical attention. Do you know anything about that particular case? Well, I, I didn't do that inquest, uh, but uh, I do know that, that as a result of that, there were some, some suggestions made to improve uh, the health care facilities. Uh, um, and, and also the Drysdale inquest resulted in some, some jury recommendations, none of which have been implemented. Whose job is it to implement them? Well, it's it's the the minister, uh, the ministry uh, of, uh, uh, ironically, they call it safety and corrections. And the minister is Madeline Mayer. That's right, Madeline Mayer, who is a uh, liberal uh, minister of community safety and correction serv correctional services. And her riding is in Ottawa, Vanier. And um, now, I, to be fair, there, since there are court cases charging the, the crown. Um, she probably does not want to comment on any specific case, but has she ever commented in general on the conditions at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center, Kevin? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, I am aware that, that one of the opposition uh, members did ask about the implementation of the, of the uh, coroner's inquest recommendations, and the answer appears to be, well, we've got a year to respond. So they know that people are being beaten, that at least one person was was uh, murdered, uh, uh, died at the hands of other inmates. Well, I heard you on the radio in the past little while. <coughs> excuse me, talking about almost daily. What are they called? Code blues. Code blues. Yes. And that means that somebody's being beaten up. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, people get beaten up uh, if they're on prescription drugs and they refuse to give up their prescription drugs to the to the tough guys, the servers. Uh, then they'll get beaten up. They get beaten up if they use the telephone without permission. The servers own the phones. <laughs> you, you, you don't touch the phone without asking permission first. Robert, you, you, you want to have to say something about that? Oh, he's just bringing back memories. It's, you know, it's... Something's got to be done here. Now, the more, the more I hear, the more it just brings back memories. Uh, management accountability, somebody's, something's got to be done. I you mean, think you would have been in a position to do what you're doing today if it had been... Just immediately following the events, like after you got out of the hospital, I guess, or, or I, did I, it take you this long it didn't, to get to this point? Well, I, I, the firm that I'd hired before, I just basically, uh, I had everywhere I went was the same mentality. Well, you're an inmate. Yeah, you got what you deserve. You know, big deal. You got you got your butt kicked in. I didn't know at that point uh, because I had suffered some dis some things in my life. It wasn't until 2009 when they did the brain scan at uh, Doctors Fac Institute and I went through a battery of testing that they've actually physically sent it to two neurologists in Florida that came back that showed 
actually physically in the there's colored pictures of the of the brain that there was brain damage. Um, so basically, I, I th um, during that time period, I didn't really want. I didn't think it was a big issue. It was just a beat up type mm -hmm. thing. You're in jail. Uh, but I always knew in my heart, it, it just, the things that I saw that were going on, it's, it's only going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And somebody's got to be accountable to this. Somebody's got to answer. Somebody's. No, no. To, the, to that oh. point, accountability, the minister, or not the minister, but the um, progressive conservative critic for correctional services, his name is Robert Bailey, and his writing is Serenia Lambton, just down the road from us. Has, um, have you heard anything from Robert Bailey, Kevin? No, uh, in fact, my office has written to the to the critic and and have uh, has not heard anything back. Um, but uh, there seems to be really a lack of any kind of political will to address this issue, and, and I suspect it's because um, you know the public really isn't behind any kind of reform. Uh, I think people have their head in the sand on on this one seems to me they should be big time behind the reform for the very reasons we talked about. These people are going to be released back into the community. And you know, when I was listening to some of the other radio shows, certain callers would call in who were also inmates in the past, and I found certain patterns coming out of those calls. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there's a lot of uh, husbands in there who've had a wife file a complaint. Yes. And then the police just come and arrest them and toss them in. As a matter of policy. Yeah, as a matter of policy. And then they get out after they see a judge and nothing happens or whatever. It seemed like a lot of them. Uh, are they an example of also who's in there? How many people are in there for things like drug possession or, or what I would call petty issues? But What I have seen um, and experienced, just like myself, there's uh, really uh, probably 80% uh, of inmates either have mental health issues, eighty percent, or drug addiction. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of the, the I saw a lot of them, the the pills, and the, and, and there's a lot of fights over there the pills because when they get issued the pills, then they trade they have to be made to trade for food to eat. If they don't tr give the pills up to the stronger inmates, they don't eat. So you know what? It's it's either there's two things in jail: either mental health or your an addict, which is a disease. Now, obviously, these these people um, sometimes they can't control what they did, what they do. Uh, I made the choice because of my addiction to violate the law. It, I didn't mind, and I paid. Was accountable to serve my time, uh, and I was willing to do that. Uh, there's no way that you should leave there with three cranial fractures and 27 stitches and a brain damage no and dis disabled for life uh, because I was willing to pay back my dues because I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, your, your sentence was 30 days, not 30 days of torture. Um, I think we're living in Canada and Ontario, and I'm really blessed, and I think it's the best place in the world to live. Uh, something's got to be done out there because more p people will continue to be uh, traumatized for life. Uh, and ask Mr. Egan in some of the interviews, I, I, I lose it. I, I just, uh, sometimes I'm emotionally unstable when I relive what has happened and what I've saw, seen. Mm -hmm. There's no way that this sh should be allowed to go on. I'm telling you, I, I wasn't even there and I lose it sometimes when I hear yeah. some of the stories. You know, I, um, anybody could end up in there. Oh, especially then on one caller and, and uh, my daddy isn't here anymore. I mean, I mean, what, what kind of crap is that? I mean, a daughter loses her father and will spend the rest of her life without a father because of the policy and procedure or mismanagement or no accountability. Uh, well, we have a caller on the line. Um, let's hear what he has to say. Go ahead, caller. Hello. Hello. How are you? Not too bad. Yeah, I'm uh, listening to your radio show and I can relate to it considerably. Um, the the treatment of people in these facilities as I've been within one is, is terrible and I've seen the behavior you're talking about. Um, I'm not sure if you've mentioned up to this point, but many of the people that are in the uh, detention centers that are two years less a day are not convicted. Um, they're actually, many of them are waiting for trial or are waiting for bail, meaning without a conviction, they're being beaten and tortured and starved. Um, Oh, yes, we, we mentioned that from the outside of the show, that there were a lot of people like that in there, yes. 
it, it's in, it's absolutely incredible what what the uh, guards have allowed to go on. I mean, I've seen it go on. I've seen uh, inmates go back and forth from, say, going to a doctor's appointment and come back, if they come back at all sometimes because they wind up in the hospital, uh, if they've disagreed with the guards, um, guards have taken it, you know, taken it to a physical level. Uh, I've definitely seen them turn their back on the shower beatings. The Don Jail uh, that I was in for uh, uh, awaiting trial and awaiting bail, um, the conditions are appalling. It is absolutely incredible. Um, granted, it is a deterrent, uh, but it ruined my my life. Um, it literally uh, destroyed my life. I um, going to that detention center for a total of about 40 days. I now have post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm unable to work, and now I'm completely a uh, ward of the system, uh, which is, serves no benefit to anyone. Um, I gladly would have paid for any crime that I did commit, but I paid far more than uh, I think anyone would think it's worth, um, and I certainly think uh, I paid a far higher price than uh, it should have been. Did you want to say something to him, Rob? Yeah, I, I want to thank you for calling in. Um, you know what? The, the the more people that get on board here and the voices that are heard, uh, the more that somebody in the right place is going to listen. Um, uh, the post-traumatic st- stress disorder I suffer from, too, along with the frontal lobe damage. Um, it's just uh, it's, something's got to be done. Uh, my suggestion to you is to... Uh, you know, call Kevin Egan at Mackenzie Lake and make an appointment. At least uh, he, he can listen to your story, and uh, and uh, maybe you can you know get involved in, in in doing a little bit of speak out. And hopefully, you know, um, maybe we'll have you here next, yeah, we'll next have, show. You know, we can have you here and and uh, whatever, and be the voice that some of the people that I've talked to that uh, have fathers and or sons and that are dead, uh, they can't speak out. Yeah, and, I mean, I. I what you've gone through is it sounds like considerably uh, greater ordeal than what I've been through yeah. um, but nonetheless um, well the disability it goes for on life. regularly yeah. and it's and it's tolerated and it's incredible that it, right. uh, that it it's just people just turn their back that's inhumane it's this is not uh, it's beyond cruel and unusual punishment so Thanks. anyway thank you for calling caller thank you for having me on thank no you. problem i guess we'll take a quick break and when we return we'll try and see what we can do to solve this problem back after this are you okay <sighs> what are you doing <sighs> just out for a little stroll move it did you have to hit me so hard Trust me, around here, you don't want anybody thinking you're soft. Thanks for the tip. Commander, you have a subspace transmission from Cardassia Prime. On screen. I'm Benjamin Sisko, commander of Deep Space Nine. My name is Mokbar. I am the Archon representing the Cardassian Empire in its case against Miles O'Brien. May I speak with him? That is not possible. May I see him? Commander. May I be assured that he is well and being treated properly? Mr. O'Brien is being treated with great care and respect. Good, because if he is not, I will hold you personally responsible. And if that sounds like a threat, it is. Well, who should we hold personally responsible for the mess that's going out there? Well, I've already mentioned two people, mm-hmm. and the Minister of Correction, Correctional Services, uh, Madeline Mayer, the uh, PC critic for that ministry, uh, Robert Bailey, and there's another person, I think, who should be speaking out on that this particular issue, and that is the, uh, the Member of Parliament, where, uh, within which... Uh, the riding who uh, the elegant Middlesex Detention Centre uh, resides, and that is um, Jeff Urich from the Elgin Middlesex London uh, riding. And um, have you heard anything from Jeff Urich, Kevin? There's a resounding silence from every uh, political party, uh, provincial, uh, local, 
uh, there, there, there seems to be no interest in, in addressing these issues. Why would that be? I mean, isn't that the basic function of government? Isn't that its prime function above all other things that it exists for is to administer justice and to make it appear that justice admi is administered? I'm not getting that impression here one way or the other. Absolutely. It, it's a very poor reflection on, on our society. Frankly, wouldn't we be, be better just letting all those people out? Well, really, I mean, you have to you have to somehow protect society. Well, I mean, I, there's 150 places in there, 400 people. Can't we let the 350 least offenders out? Would how much worse off would society be? Well, that's a good question. Uh, wh whether all of those people need to be held or not, I mean, uh, generally they're held under some kind of uh, of a court uh, order. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, incidentally, those court orders or the warrant of committal <laughs> will contain an express provision that the um, that the uh, jail is to keep that person safe. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a, that's a command of the court to the jail, which is not being followed. Now we've just been joined by someone else in the studio, and I have to uh, Jesse Hennebry just uh, stepped in. Hello, Jesse. Hello, how are you? We've got a few minutes yeah, left. Um, I just wonder if you can just go right to it. Tell us your story. Okay, uh, back in 2009, I was arrested, which I was later found not guilty, but while I was taken to jail awaiting bail, I ended up spending uh, four days inside uh, Exeter Detention Center. And uh, while I was there, they ended up putting me on range with an inmate who had just house invaded my house a few months before and while I was uh, on range with this person uh, I was kind of just minding my own business and I was told I had to shower and use the washroom that was part of the rules of being on range you had to use the shower and get cleaned up or whatever so uh, I headed over to the bathroom and as I got to the bathroom I got rushed by a bunch of guys from behind who pushed me into the bathroom and as I, I kind of, at the time, I didn't know what was going on until I seen the main, uh, the main person who house invaded my house. He stepped into the bathroom uh, out from behind all the other guys. And from there, they uh, started assaulting me in the jail. Uh, they had me pinned right up against the wall. I couldn't get out. I was yelling. I was, there was nothing I could do, really. And uh, after they had beaten me up and I was pretty much finished, they showered me off, dressed me back up, and uh, dragged me back out on range. And uh, where I sat for about five or ten minutes, no guards had came. And uh, as I was sitting there, uh, inmates were coming up to me and saying different things, like telling me that I'm supposed to, like I was assigned a se certain cell and they wanted me to sleep in a different cell. So right from there, it kind of freaked me out, and I made a run for the door. And uh, when I got to the door, there was not a guard in sight. After all this had happened, there was still not a guard in sight. And I banged on the door, the inmates grabbed me again and started dragging me back onto range, and that's when the guards finally showed up and uh, opened up the doors. That's when the inmates kind of scattered, and I made my way to the door. We only have a few minutes left. Um, we're trying to find some solutions to this. Who, first of all, who do you blame for the treatment that you received at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center? Uh, Besides the obvious people who beat you up. Yeah, uh, mostly I blame the neglect of the jail. Like, really, I think it should be on file, like, which inmates should not be with another inmate. And this was my first offense. I've never been in trouble with the police before. I've never been to jail before. So this was all a new, ex new experience for me. So to get there and not know what I'm supposed to do, I think the guards should be the ones who are supposed to be keeping you safe because they spend most of their days there. They spend every day there. Like, And when a new inmate comes in who's never been there before and doesn't know the rules or how to get along, I think it should be the guards' main priority to keep that person safe. Are we taking some kind of risk even by doing a show like this? Because if they get wind of it, is that going to be a problem for someone in that jail? Because I've heard rumors of that nature. I, that I, I, personally, and my name's Robert Broly, really? I don't care anymore. Uh, how many more people have to get maimed, uh, disabled, and killed 
Um, it's gone beyond that. I don't care the threats or whatever or what happens. Um, they need to get cameras in there. The guards need to be able to see visually the common area, not just listen for cries from inmates. Uh, they need to follow their institutional operating procedure, one guard on, one guard off, not leave a man in a but cell. Does that really matter if these are the same guards that are beating you up in the first place? Well, so, the so guards aren't... I, You know, I've only seen a couple of little guards beating up, but they're mostly turning their back and walking away and letting the other people do it. They're just like, oh, okay. Does the mm-hmm. fact that the, um, the the guards are part of a union... Now, I've heard this argument out there in the, in the past, too, is that they have another boss to go to, and that right. they have another clique of their own, and that is their right. union. Is that, sure. Does that bother you at all? Well, anytime you're in a kind of union, you all stick together. I mean, that's that's just a given... You know, it's it's more of a yeah, a camaraderie, yeah. sure. But you know what? It's just there's just it's just sad. Yeah, Kevin, we only have a couple minutes left. Can you can you sum it up? What would you like to see done here? Well, you know, there there's uh, <clears throat> Canada's a signatory to to um, a United Nations uh, uh, agreement on the minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, and that's being ignored completely out at Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. When we're on the subject of guards, there, there's a requirement that that uh, they should be carefully selected, uh, with with uh, a view toward their integrity, their humanity, their professional capacity, uh, and and their personal suitability for the work, and and that appears to be an oversight as well. I mean, when you've got guards, in Jesse's case, they ridiculed him after he was beaten up. The guards did. The r- guards ridiculed yes. Jesse. Um, w- when you've got guards turning a blind eye to, to beings that are happening day after day, there's a problem with their integrity. And, and um, it it's goes back to how they were selected in the first place. Uh, I mean, we, we could go on for, for several more hours, I think, about I'm all I'm sure we could do a lot of shows right on this. Well, this is only two inmates, um, former inmates here in the, in, in the studio today. And, uh, you have 30 <laughs> cases lined up, and you're just the one lawyer. Are there any other lawyers treating any, uh, any other cases there? You know? uh, there? There are a, a few others I've heard from, mm-hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I think we're really only dealing with the tip of the iceberg. Uh, people are afraid to come forward. Uh, these gentlemen are brave enough to, to come out and, and speak out. And uh, every time we do one of these uh, shows or there's an article in the paper, more people are encouraged to come forward and say, yeah, that happened to me too. Yeah. And, and uh, I think that, that uh, shows like yours provide that kind of service that emboldens people and really are a vehicle to, to the social change that we need. Well, well, we'd like to tell our listeners, too, that uh, this show will be online, as will a lot of the other testimonies from the other shows. We're going to start a page for you folks because this is a very serious issue. So keep an eye out for that. Are we done, Robert? I think we're done, and I'd really like to thank uh, Robert Perley and Jesse Hennebury, especially Absolutely. for having the courage to come in here and talk about this today, and especially uh, Kevin Egan. Maybe for we'll catch you cases. again next time. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thanks for me. coming in. That's it for today, folks, and we got to head out for another week. Join us again next week when we continue our journey in the right direction. Until then, you know what to do. We'll see you then. Fade into color, color into black and white, under the bedclothes. Everything will be alright. Oh, you're a teenager, aren't you? How old are you? 21? Close. Well, you look like a teenager. Don't ever go to prison because the guards will f you. Alright?